Thank you very much. I'm going to talk about a technique for looking inside the brain. It's been around for quite a while. Uh, it has achieved, and I hope I'm going to show you somewhere it ha has achieved, but I think it's still got a lot more to do. I think it's underachieving, and I think it needs people like you to ask questions of this technique, and hopefully some of you will advance the methodology itself to make it more available to a wider audience than it has so far. Now, the human brain is the most complex biological structure known to man. It's the most investigated and the least understood. It's the major frontier of human understanding in the universe to a large extent. But in Europe, every year, we spend 800 billion euros on brain disorders. This is direct and indirect costs. Now, this puts the Greek debt into insignificance, really in terms of every year, this is not only the cost, but also the social suffering of people with brain disorder. Let me just show you examples. Depression is the highest, over 100 billion. Then dementia, schizophrenia, anxiety, soft diseases, which you know, uh, you've got no reason or idea what it is, but you know there's something chemically wrong in the brain. And then you go around to things which you know a bit more about, like stroke and epilepsy. And secondly, you've got things like child disorders and mental retardation. All these add up to a really big bill. And many of you will know people <coughs> suffering from these. And the status quo and advances are very limited. So clearly, we need to know more about the brain, particularly the chemistry of the brain, which um, is affecting this. Uh, internationally, then, if I project the 8 billion euros to the world, we're talking about $4 trillion dollars every year is spent on this. And of course, the drug industry itself is spending a, an unknown but a large amount of, of money on drugs. And of course, we've got 7 billion people in the world. And their main resource is their brain. So how do we know? I mean, we know little so much about it. Just take one uh, experiment. These are Whitehall silver servants, bright, middle class, healthy people in living in London, and they looked at their cognitive function. And they just saw their reasoning is deteriorating from the ages of 45 downwards. So here we have in society an example of resource which is declining. We educated them, their position of influence, but they were losing that facility. What is that? Is this um, because they smoke or whatever? No, and more than likely it's something chemically going wrong in the brain which we know little or nothing about. So the vision was many years ago, could we be able to study the biological function of the living brain in, in, in life, in the living person, to help understand treatment, uh, how brain disorders, and how the normal brain works. And also, of course, a lot of work done in laboratories and animals and cells and tissues. How can we translate that into what the human being uh, is about? We've got a big gap between people working in laboratories with white coats and test tubes and all that sort of stuff, and, 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 and slides and microscopes, to actually what's happening in the diseased human being. We've got to bridge this gap. And the answer to that is technology. Technology drives science, as you all know. And the technology I'm talking about is called molecular imaging, where you're able to look at the molecular structures and the pathways and interaction in the living human being without hurting them. And the trick is to take a molecule and make it radioactive, to substitute one of the, the atoms for a radioactive form, which emits gamma rays. And then when this molecule is inside the body, with radiation detectors, you can pick up the gamma rays as they emerge from the body. And to make those isotopes, you need a cyclotron, which is a particle accelerator, a big version is in CERN, small ones a cyclotron, high energy particle, which when you, like a proton, and you bombard stable molecules like nitrogen. You can make radioactive forms of carbon. You know, carbon-12 is stable. It's a radioactive form. And a cyclotron can make isotopes like oxygen-15, um, which is a two-minute half-life. You make it. After two minutes, it's only half is there. And so you've got to make it actually where you're going to use this stuff. And nitrogen and carbon-11 is a 20-minute half-life. Half it's gone after 20 minutes. So you need to have one of these cyclotrons sitting next to where you're going to use it if you want to do the sort of things I'm talking about. But when the oxygen-15 decays, it emits a positron. It's like an electron, but positively charged. 
captured, they captured, annihilate. So coming out of the body are two gamma rays in opposite direction. So I've given this gentleman here radioactive oxygen. Coming out of his brain are pairs of gamma rays coming out in all directions. And we make use of that by putting radiation detectors around the body, and they work in coincidence. So when both of these detectors fire, we know somewhere in there a positron was captured. I was lucky enough, <clears throat> many years ago, I wanted to work, I'm a physicist background, and I wanted to work in London. It's the only place to be in London, of course. <laughs> Nile doesn't agree with me. I wanted to work in London, so I wrote, I was in Birmingham University, then a master's degree, and I wrote to five hospitals. I wanted to do medical physics. I didn't know what the hell these hospitals were, I had no idea where they were, but luckily somebody at Hammersmith Hospital had a job. And as it happened to be, it's the first hospital in the world to have its own cyclotron. It was home built, that one there, and it was opened by the Queen in 1955. And it was designed as a, by the Medical Research Council to look at the effects of radiation on, on biological systems and also to make isotopes for, for, for clinical use. And I joined there in, in the mid-60s and became interested in how one can use these isotopes. So the vision uh, having in around 68 was, how can we develop these, uh, use these nice isotopes, which weren't being used very much in those days, how can we use them to begin to look at the living human brain? How we could image the brain using those nice isotopes, and then how can we then go on and use them for studying diseases, and then how can we really show the world it's really worth doing this so we can obtain new information, which is consensus changing, uh, which may, has an impact. So the, we started off with oxygen. Now oxygen is the, one of the most abundant elements in, 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 in the universe, and you all know that if, if, you, let's say, if your brain is starved of oxygen, you're in trouble, right? So why not use radioactive oxygen to look at the brain? So it's a, as I say, it's the longest lived, two minutes, so you really have to work with it next to the cyclotron. So I had an idea that I, by just breathing radioactive oxygen and looking at the brain, surely you can begin to see where the brain is metabolizing. But in the UK, we didn't have, we had some imaging devices, but not very good ones. The best one was in Boston, Massachusetts. So off I, off I went to Boston, and this machine here um, is a rays of detectors which c c capture the gamma rays as they come out from the chest, in this case, or the brain and give you an image of the distribution. And this was a result of my breathing. But I'm constantly breathing radioactive oxygen, and you're looking at the side of my brain. And this was the image we recorded. Now, it doesn't look very much, but it's sort of roughly the shape of a brain. And the dark areas, <laughs> it's a good Welsh brain. I know they're English <laughs> brains. And um, the dark areas are the, are the white matter. They're less, um, less, less metabolically active than the top of the brain and the gray matter. This is the blood volume of the brain, so this fits inside there. Now, this looks very humble, but it was the first image of the human brain's metabolism ever recorded. That was nearly 40 years ago. So I'm going to go forward now. When I saw that, I was working overnight, and I saw the results. I said, Christ, this has got a future. Because to be able to look non-invasively without digging into someone's brain, the function of a living being it must be important. So. Fast forward, um, um, nearly 20 years. The cameras were developed. Well, instead of having two planes, now they're complete annulus of detectors, shown small detectors here, and recording the gamma rays again, as I showed you. But because you've got a complete ring, you can then record the data you record. You can reconstruct it at, 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 as a tomogram, as a, in depth across the brain, as if you slice through the brain. And the example shown here, this is a, a human brain. We're looking at um, dopamine in the brain, the deep structures. So you can see uh, the front of the brain, back of the brain. You can see how you, by having a tomogram from the reconstructed data, you can see deep into the brain where the radioactivity is actually collecting. So it's very powerful. And also you can measure the qu how much radioactivity and use that for, for quantification. Then the chemists became very clever. They were able to develop their chemistry so they could very quickly change uh, a carbon-11, carbon-12 for carbon-11, all within the fact that this is decaying so rapidly, and do it remotely because it's a very lot of radioactivity. And I'll give you some ex examples of which sort of uh, tools they've developed, that we've developed. 
This molecule here is very specific for a serotonergic subtype receptor. Now, you know serotonin is, is, is change in depression, for example. Um, by labeling it with carbon-11, this is the image you can get, and you can get it over time. And you can see some parts of the brain are dark, which is hot, where, where the radioactivity is collecting. Some parts are not, which shows that this little receptor is much more avid in this part of cortex here than a cerebellum. So it's very specific for a certain part of the brain, which is, has this neurotransmitter system. Um, opiate receptors, this is my brain looking at diphenorphin. Opiate receptors where uh, opium works and, and other narcotics. And again, you can see where these receptors in the brain are residing, much more active here in the uh, occipital, uh, sorry, thalamus as opposed to occipital. And anti-cancer drugs. You could label an anti-cancer drug. Is the drug getting to the tumor? And this, is the, this drug here was labeled, you can see there. And there's a brain tumor, glioma there. And you can see how much more radioactivity is actually in the tumor, which is a good sign. And this study was done in very early phase development of this drug, called phase one, phase two. And it then went on. It's now a, a billion dollar a year drug uh, in, internationally. Oh, that little bit of evidence showing it was actually getting to the tumor and residing in the tumor, I think helped a little bit to encourage people to take it further. And again, dopaminergic, not only uh, carbon-11, but also fluorine 18 can be used. And this is in, uh, in the dopaminergic neurotransmitter system. You see beautiful concentration just in these structures in the brain. And as you know, people with Parkinson's disease have problems with, with dopa and L-dopa. And again, you can see strikingly how much more was taken up there, not so much there. You can see how specific it was, is to that. So this is very exciting, I think. And so what have we actually achieved? It's all very nice showing pictures and pretty ones. And nice to them, but what have we achieved? And what are the criteria of achievement? Well, it's not how many grants you can get and how many PhD students you can get, how many conferences you can get, and how many abstracts or how many airplane tickets you jump on. It actually depends on what's the impact. What how did it change your thinking, which you never knew before, and will be ideally cited in 20, 30 years' time. That's what I call achievement, as opposed to what's been done. I want to show you some examples, just to show you there's something in it. And I'll pick up these three, the big ones, the big, the big three I showed you in the, in, 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 the, in the financial ranking, and something on drug development. Dementia. We all heard about dementia now. I, actually, I was reading um, today in the New England Journal. They still haven't got a really good drug for dementia. It's a growing problem as the population gets older. And two studies, uh, 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 one from London, my old group, were looking at very early dementia. And the hot spots here uh, show quantitatively of this tracer, which looks at inflammation. It's an inflammatory marker, if you like. It's actually looking at the brain's defense mechanisms. The brain has microglia, and when there's a problem, they upregulate and they, they try and defend the, whatever's going wrong. And showing that very early in dementia, you've got this going on before the even structural changes, that the, the, the brain's autoimmune system is beginning to be alert. You're looking at the, pre the beginning phase, before you get atrophy of the brain and you go off, the brain is beginning to alert to a, a an insult of some description. Oh, sorry. And here, uh, amyloid is thought to be a, a, a material which are known to be laying down in the brain of dementia people, because it would be toxic, and there's now therapy to try and remove uh, amyloid. But you can see here's somebody with a lot of am lot of this marker. This looks at amyloid. A lot of it here. This is MR. The two people, they're called mild cognitive impaired. They've got two people uh, who are showing some signs of cognitive decline. Will they progress to become Alzheimer's disease? How do you know which one's going to get worse? Well, those which have high levels of this marker progress. But those, those which are same a non-progressor, so they can begin to differentiate between those which will get worse and those which will not, which I think is an advance, really, if you want to bring in therapies earlier and pick out those who should benefit the most from it. Depression. Um, fascinating. The marker of, I showed you earlier on for looking at this, the serotonergic system, uh, the Finns did a very interesting study. They looked at psychotherapy, which everybody thinks is for the birds, 
but actually did this change the people's chemistry of the brain. And these are where the changes were, from baseline to six months later, whatever it was. And compared to the same uh, a cohort of patients who were on antidepressant drugs. So these were the, the real advances psychotherapy was having on the chemistry of the brain. Now, isn't that fascinating? Like you're actually showing you know, objective information. When people stop smoking, they looked at this before and after, and you see the increases of the, the marker, or sort of, of, of this mar or enzyme that increases, and um, this enzyme is known to chew up serotonin. And therefore, when you stop smoking, you increase the enzyme, you chew up your serotonin, and you get depressed. So the main reason people can't stop smoking, they get hugely depressed. Now, when you think about the major, I wish you stopped waving at me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, schizophrenia, you're going to hear something about hallucinations soon. And um, there's a patient who's in the camera watching and then hallucinating, and these areas are lighting up in a speech in, in the ear. Here's a plug, can't see anything. Inside the brain, you see changes in blood flow. And schizophrenia, you can detect the changes of L-dopa, the dopaminergic system, how you can predict people who are at risk going on to become schizophrenic. These are young people. Do you medicate them now? Do you need, these are markers for knowing whether or not you should treat them. A good insight into the future. And also in drugs, you can use it for knowing how much drug to give without over-medicating people. I like this one. They plotted this receptor against personality. How people's brains, the receptors change uh, over time, that gives you an insight to the future of that. So it's quite a complex process, psychotron, labeling, a lot of chemistry going on, quite an active, it's big science, really, and you need, um, oh, sorry, and then the image at the end, go. Cool. You don't really need a foot, up until now, you need a big laboratory, like a Fort Knox type of place, or a Pentagon sort of place, but the future is, of course, in order to, therefore, as a consequence, this field of it's very exciting, I think. It's smoking, it's not really blazing. Um, we need to improve upon that. And the answer, of course, is access to that. And for that, I think we need to bring on new technology. And there are new technologies coming along to do that. And we want to go from where we were with, the, with, with computing many years ago to, to the laptop, bringing it out from that phase to the, where we are today with the technologies I've told you about. Thank you very much. Thank you.